Folks, welcome inside the Parisi Palace, high above 3773 East Broadway. This is the Jake Feinberg Show, coming on Power Talk. Thank you so much for making us part of your day today. Aspiration, in its simplest definition, is a lovely flame climbing heavenward. True aspiration can and does make us feel that if God is for us, who could eventually stand against us? We feel a desire to have God on our side, but we need the aspiration to throw ourselves on God's side. The sun is the only remedy for dark clouds in the sky. Similarly, there is no other medicine than aspiration for our troubled hearts. Aspiration is the first rung of the sky-kissing ladder. Realization is the last. True human aspiration has three intimate friends, purification, quietude, and intensity. Aspiration has an enemy called impatience. Aspiration is the mounting flame of our divine wish to raise ourselves to the crest and crowning of divine perfection. The body aspires through action. The vital aspires through struggles. The mind aspires through self-search. The heart aspires through the feeling of union. The soul aspires to the perfection of God's manifestation. Tim Moore, welcome to the Jake Feinberg Show. Wow, Jake. I don't know that I have anything to say after that. Well, that, and I just, just to be clear, I, I'm riffing off one of my uh, favorite, uh, he's not, I shouldn't say he was a teacher of mine, but I, I love the cat, is a Sri Chimnoy. Um, is a oh, great, yeah. Okay, yeah. That, well, yeah, but he was, his um, ashram was up here in upstate New York. So I know Sri Chimnoy's people well. Did as you, do I, Guru Mai, and there was a bunch of uh, very busy ashrams up here. Can you talk about your, did, did you, what was, um, I, I've talked to enough cats from your generation to know that at a certain point, um, they were tired of seeing their friends becoming roadkill. Um, and there was a lot of hard drug use and a lot of people were searching for, um, expanded and elevated consciousness without the use of, of hard drugs. Uh, and so they found guys like Sheree Chimnoy, McLaughlin's a great example of that. Uh, Larry Cor- yeah. you know, the, Coriel and Felix Cavallari and Carlos Santana, Michael Sh- on and on. And some people went deeper into it than others. Did you have a spiritual awakening at any point in your existence? And if so, break it down. I'll break it down for you a little bit. It might take about oh, three minutes to run through it. Um, I would say that when I first entered the business, I was just out of art school, and uh, I was more of a, I was, I was brought up in the arts, so that meant that I was going to a fine arts school. I was, I was working on my visual skills. Uh, I had drawn since I was four, and I started um, writing songs in my freshman year, um, and uh, the songs just got good enough that. Uh, when I came to Woodstock, uh, let me see, four years after graduating, um, I came up here because I wrote John Simon, who was producing the band, and I said, is there any session work? He says, no, there's no session work, but it's a great place to write and become an artist. And and I had been in Woodstock once as a kid, I and I did a couple of exploratory visits, and I came up here. So I'll tell you a little bit about the town. The town was... Uh, 
right after the Woodstock Festival. So it was, there were totally lost people running, you know, walking around in town um, in hippie garb. Uh, but there was a whole other strata of um, people who were aspiring in the spirit of what you just read. And um, I pretty much, my first friend <laughs> was, the, was the head of the occult bookstore in Woodstock. Right. Uh, he was, we just started like passing books back and forth. So I was pretty much fell into it. I mean, I arrived here with four, vol- four volumes of, of um, Meher Baba and uh, had some friends in Philadelphia before I left who were into uh, Baba. And um, so it just sort of started flowing. But I, I got to say that I really did not get it. Uh, I had a lot of talent. I, I had been working. I had had a band with Daryl Hall in Philadelphia. Uh, and we were both headed for the heart of the pop music realm. And uh, we put out one album together with a band called Gulliver on Electra. And um, so when you talked about impatience yeah. and ambition in that quote, it really it struck me because um, if you get frustrated on that path, uh, you turn into more like Gollum than Sri Chin Noi. <laughs> I agree. No, you know, it's 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 something that in my habitual nature um, continually crops up just at, at 43, wanting to get to some place that you're never going to get to, but you think you're going to reach some sort of accomplishment or feed your ego, and then you wind up yeah. s- stumbling into, into the darkness, you know, in t- instead of the light. I read a few books on concentration, uh, meditation, that sort of thing. I did not get it. Um, I thought I was failing whenever my mind wandered. And what was absent was the guy who was watching the mind wandering. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. That's they, right, yeah. They, I didn't get the point that there's that there's a witness there watching all this go, going on. And um, so to fast forward, I went through four albums with Electra. Um, did, was not able to break through. And... Uh, At the end of that fourth album, my mom died. I had to take her house apart. And uh, it was a pretty low point in my life. And the thing that broke through was um, just around the time that I started to make my fifth album, my fifth and last album for Electra, I started dating someone who was six months sober. And she asked me to go to Al-Anon. Well, I, I don't know what you, whether you know what goes on at Al-Anon, but people talk from their hearts. And I, for the first time in my life, saw people sitting around in a circle actually being honest with no bullshit. And this is like coming on the tail end of Woodstock being suffused with cocaine users mm. who repeated everything they said every 20 minutes. So this was a, a revelation for me. And it started me on the path of... Uh, I don't know, reading John Bradshaw's books, um, getting into what um, what my path had been and looking into it. And the turnaround for me was uh, going to Zen Mountain Monastery. I had been doing something called co-counseling, which, which allowed me to, for, for the first time, get the experience that I could make a difference in a one-on-one situation. Um, I learned some counseling skills. I did a lot of one-on-one counseling, but other people had the same skills and you trade time in this particular discipline. And uh, I realized that I was for the first time able to achieve um, intimacy and honesty with somebody on a one-on-one basis. And, uh, you know, when you're, when you've got a lot of talent, Jake, um, things come to you. People look up to you, they admire you. And, um, and you seem to have some kind of, uh, you know, charm or, or aura around you. And um, I wrote on that for a long time. And the main reason I wrote on it was because uh, I don't think I had very good me and you skills when I was a young kid and through the first four albums of my, of my career. So uh, um, when I finally had this experience, I said, well, there's something else missing here. My mind is still all over the place. And I sat down with somebody who was, um, had gone to Naropa, and he had um, been brought up as a uh, Buddhist psychologist. And uh, we sat down and had breakfast. I said, listen, I've had some real breakthroughs here, but uh, there's something missing, and I know it's missing. There's something 
I'm sensing something in the Buddhist realm that maybe you can tell me about and maybe you can get me started on the path. And he said, well, there's two places you could go. You can go to KTG, which is Tibetan Buddhism. That, they have a large temple up on the mountain here now. They were just building it at that time. And um, you can go there, and there's a lot of color and celebration and bardos and mythology there. Or you can go and do stripped-down work at Zen Mount Monastery and just go into Bizendo. They have open uh, open sessions on Wednesday night. Why don't you go? So I started going, and um, and uh, the Roshi there, um, Chan Daido Lori, uh, realized I had talent and that I was lost. <laughs> We spent a lot of time hanging out in his uh, in his quarters, in the abbot's um, quarters, you know, just sure. doing funny stuff in media. On You know, he was into computer, he was into photography and computer animation and all kinds of things, you know, on the side. Um, so we, we hung on a secular basis, and I did this student training there. And I realized pretty soon that um, that was the missing piece. Because when you sit there, um, you don't close your eyes. Your eyes are at a 45-degree angle. You're, you're sitting in your posture uh, on your zafatan and your cushion. And, um, and you're doing half-hour sessions. And you might do half-hour sessions for an entire weekend, you know, and taking breaks for, for food. And when you do orioki, they bring you your food. You're in the zendo all the time. So um, all of that... Uh, I won't call it training. I'll call it practice. Um, getting that practice under my belt changed things for the rest of my life. And that um, was 30 years ago. Um, I mean, it, it, it just, it, uh, all of a sudden the, uh, the, the, the thoughts, I mean, what, what changed constitutionally for you? Well, have you practiced, Jay? Do, do you know? Uh, have you had some experience? Uh, yeah, yeah. In any I mean, not practice? not not in uh, in a really formal sense, but enough to um, to understand what you're referring to. Mm-hmm. So your question was, what changed? You you said it, it changed my life thirty, and for the last thirty years, I'm just trying to figure out what uh, how you oh yeah yeah how you evolved. Um, better connection with people from the co counseling. And um, better understanding that whatever thought I have and whatever emotional reaction I have to it is transitory. So if I get sunk, right. a combination of stoicism and, and Zen practice basically keeps me from being washed away in the current. You know, uh, John Simon is a dear friend, and I it warms my heart to hear that, uh, you know, that that was one of, or at least the cat you reached out to uh, in Woodstock. And, and the... I really want, you know, he's, he's in my, or one of our excerpts from our interview is in my third book and it was very enlightening because he talked about the magic of, or why there was so much magic on those, you know, uh, consequential albums that he produced. And it was all about pre-production versus post-production. And, 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 you know, he would be with Levon and Robbie and those cats with the band and they'd work a lot of stuff out in the pre-production phase how they wanted arrangements to sound or vocal harmonies but once the record button went on that was pretty much it there was no post-production and today we're saturated in post-production so much so that the song could have the best lyrics in the world it could have a great groove and it sounds like warmed over Velveeta cheese because of the post-production and the fact that they could take the soul out of the music because of the technology. And maybe mm-hmm. your records in Electra didn't break through to the to the pop level where you, know, you got a huge radio hit or something. But mm-hmm. is it fair to say that you're – can you talk a little bit about the pre-production components of your early albums and the emphasis, if it was, on pre-production over post-production? Well, um, it's funny. Each album was different. Um, right, right. I mean, my third album I did in L.A., and we did a few sessions, uh, uh, I think one night, maybe two nights, with Jeff Porcaro running through the tunes. Uh, Jeff was the drummer, you know, the opening drummer. And we had a couple of others on this on the session, but it was mostly Jeff. And um, But that was pretty much it. And then that album was relying on the 
studio machine of L.A., you know. So that's why the the album has this sheen and consistency uh, song to song. Um, the first album yeah. I did with my friend from Philadelphia, Nick Jameson. Um, wow. And Nick was a huge fan of British engin- uh, recording and engineering. Um, so we were both Beatle freaks. And he knew his gear really well. He and Todd Rundgren had been trading licks, and Todd was in Woodstock at the time, too. Mm-hmm. And, and so Nick, out of all my producers, let me play most of the, most of the things on most of the um, instruments on the record. Uh, we had... Uh, Roy Markowitz on drums, Stephen Gelfand. We did a bunch of cuts with him. We did one cut with Bernard Purdy. Um, we actually tried to cut Second Avenue with Bernard Purdy. It's a funny story. To, to, Ian Gordon Edwards. I would love. I would. Lo- I mean, I, vid- I love those. Those, those. those are dear. What happened? Please tell them. Because I. It's funny. You. I. Well, I did this. It, just. It, I want. I just want. No, I just want to tell you I, before you before you go on. Like I. I just, it flashed in my head after I talked to you, but my, uh, the mother of my children is, is from Taiwan. So I had a chance to go back there several times and, um, you know, there's not a lot of record stores in maybe in Taipei, but not in like some of the bigger cities in Taiwan, but in the South where she lived. And I went to this, this big city called Kaohsiung and they, this guy had a very pot, you know, nice store, you know, not a really typical record store, but he had dozens of records and sure enough, the Tim Moore record made its way to Taiwan. I bought it there. And Are you kidding me? Uh, that first one, you dude. With, you, you, I, you got in Taiwan? <laughs> dude, I'm telling <laughs> so you, man, funny. it is so tripped out. And that's when I saw... You, what's that? Are you talking vinyl? Or are you vinyl, vinyl. About, vinyl. Uh, yeah, vinyl. Vinyl. Yeah. vinyl. And, and, and I saw I saw Purdy on what played on one track. Anyway, the floor is yours. I'd love to hear about Purdy and Edwards cooking with, with... It's a short story. We were recording in Bridgeport, Connecticut, uh, where I did a lot of the first album. Mm-hmm. And um, we were trying to get a better recording of Second Avenue than the demo I'd done in Boston uh, two years previous. And uh, it turned out we wound up using that demo. But we're trying to cut it with Purdy. And he's got Gordon Edwards up there. So what's the name of that band? Um, Stuff. That they had with Corn and the Stuff. Stuff. Dupree? What? Stuff, Stuff yeah. Okay, so Gordon was a bass player with stuff. So Bernard and Gordon came up in the car, set up, and we started recording Second Avenue. I think it was the second cut we tried to do. And um, <laughs> and uh, Nick didn't, you know, he was, he was sort of like, can we, what's the beginning of the song? Oh, yeah. Since we can no longer make a girl, I found a new place to live. And, and Purdy's going, you know, and I'm going like, I'm playing along with it. Yeah, I'm just doing my arpeggiated, you know. Oh yeah. Oh my god. So, um, and Gordon's playing the chart, and so Nick comes over the talk back, squawk, and then, hey, pretty, pretty. Wait a minute, for a minute, Bernard. Tim, play the piano part. Listen to listen to the piano part. And so I start playing this arpeggiated Chopin-esque piano part. A little bit of Elton, a little bit of Chopin. And, and Gordon Edwards leans back in his chair, literally on two legs of the chair, and he says, Oh, Bernard, I know what he's talking about. Second Avenue up around 61st Street. <laughs> <laughs> Upper East Side. <laughs> <Ta-bum>. <laughs> wow, that's so funny. Needless man. to say, we, we we did two more takes and and moved on to other cuts. <laughs> so he was he was basically. I mean, I just for the record, he was saying it, it was more uh, uh, class- more upper, upper east side, upper crust, upper, upper crust, side. classicalized stuff. Not the grease, the grease yeah, right on the border of, of of the upper east side. Right, not 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 not, not 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 slugs down in the lower vi- east village where they're playing, yeah. bl- you know, blues and two blocks from the Queensboro Bridge, brother. <laughs> wow. That, so, um, yeah, I know that studio because in Connecticut, because. Um, this this drummer from Bugalusa, Louisiana, Herschel Dwellingham, wound up cutting Sweet Nighter with Weather Report up at that studio. I mean, th- at the end of the day, 
Um, I wanted you to talk about this concept. I, 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 especially this, this relates more to, you know, I know that you were ensconced in the Philadelphia music scene and, but the idea, um, you know, oftentimes, um, you know, there's this, uh, I, I see a lot of rhythm sections today. This is like pre pandemic, but on the bandstand, a lot of them are very uptight and concerned about where the one is the downbeat. Where's the one, where's the one they want to lock it in and and the kind of music that i really truly love is um you know collectively as a band you won't find this on record so much more in a live setting but when the band is going for it and taking chances and they lose where the one is all right and then ultimately that one will always come back around and when they come back in on the one all together after losing it that is the magic of music and that beautiful mm -hmm. and, and i wanted you to just talk about your concept of any note can be the one. I don't have that concept, <laughs> to be honest. Um, I I don't go searching for the one. The one's been all over the place for me. You know, I was a speedy player when I was young. Um, I know exactly how to construct a track myself um, because I have help with, um, you know, with new technology and stuff like that. So um, I might do stuff on the grid or I might do stuff off the grid. But um, my my place that I come from is trying to get a little parts to fit together and to um, keep density down. In other words, interplay up and density down. So uh, Well, I mean, back, back in the – when you were – I mean, what was the most – like sort of i'm talking about bandstand i don't want i'm not talking about the studio i'm talking live on the bandstand mm. like were you the like can you talk about your experience in a in a band where uh it was not so I, I, all i'm saying is that the, the, what we're lo the the issue the crisis in music today is that well aside from just the idea of you know lack of record industry lack of intellectual property rights, fairness to musicians and things like that, is that you have human beings playing to machine parts. When back in the day, every drummer, whether they were in rock or jazz, or I mean, everybody had their own individual sound. And rhythm has become yeah. so quantized that it's not danceable. And it, there's no groove to it. And, and even Purdy, I mean, as yeah. funky as he is, it's still round. So, like, can you talk about... At least early on, maybe you've got comfortable in the studio, you know, doing your thing. But you know, I can talk about it and to, uh, on the bandstand as a session player at Sigma Sound. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. I mean, I mean, well, I, I mean, I, I, I did some yeah. Sessions. Go I ahead. did some sessions with uh, Ronnie Baker and Earl Young. Oh man. And talk um, about Norman. that. Yeah, Vince Montana. And those guys, you know, the uh, well, uh, they were just a grooving wonderful section. The sections I was into back then was, you know, in the pop realm, of course, the Beatles, because all their parts were so great. Sure. Um, and there was so much excitement, you know, they understood how to keep the excitement at any tempo in any field. Um, you know, Ringo is a unique drummer and you listen to him. He's metronomic, you know, he's got a great time, but he's also, you listen to his foot. You listen to his foot on those records and, you know, his kick drum. Um, and he cops the feel perfectly, you know, just in the kick drum part. Um, and then is, um, so, you know, as an observer watching stuff like that, I slipped into Philadelphia and started playing with um, uh, session musicians there. And those guys were playing from charts for the most part, but they were putting a lot of feel into it. I mean, Ronnie Baker, they didn't write out his parts, you know. He had this second, his bass playing had this second sense. I mean, when Tommy Bell wrote a chart for him, yeah, he played that because Tommy's charts were tight, tight, tight. But um, I, so on the bandstand, I, most of that I feel uh, when I play jazz. But I don't, you know, I'm not a uh, public publicly known jazz player. I've just played jazz piano all my life and I've got some cats I play with up here. Um, I love that. No, can you, go, can you talk about a seminal, like a scene uh, in Sigma sound where things were, I mean, the, the, the best kept, I mean, yeah, Bell might've written some charts, but a lot, I mean, the greatest Rangers, Gene Page and 
so many of these cats, I mean, they would probably just give a chord chart to people and let them play them, sit, like do what they came in to do best. I mean, can you yeah, talk? It was 61 and a half a dozen of the other. I mean, if you're talking about disco inferno, that's not all written out. You know, they're working stuff out in the in, in the studio. I wasn't there at that session, but you know, you listen to that. But then you listen to Could It Be I'm Falling in Love. I mean, Tommy wrote out just about everything on that chart. Um, and it's one of my favorite records out of that uh, out of that whole workshop. You know, from 67, you've got uh, Kenny doing Expressway to Your Heart. And up through 74 or so, it just gets better and better. Um, I mean, which which can you talk? I mean, that's the that's the po- that's the most erogenous pocket of music of all time. I mean, how did you get into the, the that stu- the, and were I you was, were you were you right were you a writing that? essentially writing or or playing? I was I was a, I was a writer and I was a player. I was a guitar player uh, and you know electric guitar and um, and I was part of a session group that was uh, working for this uh, production company. I was brought in as a staff writer. Uh, the bass player from my first originals band, um, Tom Sellers, uh, called me up and he said, uh, they need writers down here. You want to come down? And I said, yeah. And they put me on salary and I became a staff writer. So all that early Hall and Oates stuff that you hear, um, uh, there's a number of my songs on there. Wow. Angelina, wow. The Reason Wong. Wow. So if you go back to the early pastimes behind Hall and Oates stuff, uh, the most played songs on there are one of theirs and two of mine. If you look at Spotify, and and, and they and they were I'm just you gotta you gotta excuse my naivety, but they wound up they did those albums at Sigma Sound, or were you just going to different studios in Philly? No, uh, we did a Daryl and I had a band called Gulliver, and we recorded that entire album at Sigma. Oh. And um, Daryl and I were living next door to each other. We had town these tiny little mini townhouses that. They have in Philadelphia on Quint Street. So we live next door to each other. And we get blasted, you know, at 10 o'clock at night. And uh, I'd go up to one of our two upstairs rooms, which were the music rooms. You know, three-story townhouses, one room for each each floor. And um, so we wrote the Gulliver tunes. I mean, he had a bunch of nonsense lyrics, and I just put them to music, you know. <laughs> <laughs> he had all these stone things in his in his sketchbook, and I said, oh, that sounds pretty good." That That's is right, right still on you. <laughs> that oh man, you still there? Yeah, I'm still here. Uh, yeah, I yeah. Uh, um, no, I was gonna say, can you like uh, who has? Um, I mean, there were so many amazing. I, I cannot even believe you were in Philadelphia. I mean, maybe you weren't. I mean, were you going to the showboat and Peps and going to see some of these legendary? I mean, Train was there. No, actually, I wasn't. The only the only legend that I wanted to go out and see. I mean, I didn't have a lot of money to go out to clubs and that sort of thing. The um, but I went out to see Roy Buchanan a lot. Talk and about was, you know, talk was, about Roy because man, I think that he gets lost in the. Sh- he, I mean, I've seen Stanley Clark on his albums. I mean, the dude was like, well, he, yeah. Him and him and Jimmy Burton um, invented the telly, basically that that whole style of playing the telly. Um, James Burton was cleaner, and Roy discovered this sound, you know, either through a slash speaker or overdriving his tubes or anything. Uh, but um, uh, but Roy had this sound, and I first heard it on a Bobby Gregg record called Potato Peeler, and I said, God, what is that? That's a guitar, I, dude, I like, need to, are you Bobby. I dude, I cannot. I'm so glad that you brought up Bobby Gregg, man. I mean, is that is he still with us? I have no idea, dude. Uh, Bob idea. Potato Peeler. I've never heard that out. Where you haven't? That's an ins- it's, it's on, no, it's on YouTube, man. Look oh up, my uh, Bobby Gregg, God, Potato Peeler, insane. and you'll hear you'll hear like a, I don't know, twelve bars or twenty four bars of Roy Buchanan playing. You know, his first recording, probably. Um, he was just coming out. and um, But you know who used to go to South Jersey all the time to see Roy? I never saw him there, but I was having, um, I was up at a friend's, friend's house down in Sullivan County here, right over the border from New Jersey. And um, my this friend had introduced me to Les Paul. Sure. And I had sat in with Les a couple of times at the Iridium. And, oh uh, my! Are you? Listen to you, dude. What? What? Are you kidding me? 
Yeah, I sat in with him at the Iridium. I did, I did standards with, you know, I, I ruled out the little known and hardly ever heard um, Tim Moore singing standards. I sang, um, I thought about you. Oh my, I dude! I need, me. I need tapes of that, dude. That is where the rubber meets the road for Jimmy. There are no tapes, or you know, there may be tapes. There may, dude. That's um, so badass, is, dude. I mean, was there? Wait a minute, less is done. There are tapes. You, you just reminded me, man. <laughs> and there are tapes. Less is done. Les Paul's son taped everything at the Iridium. And I, let's. Get, I mean, I want to at least hear. I want to hear the standards of more. I mean, that is unreal. Well, my I grew up with that. My dad was program director at WNEWAM in the fifties. Whoa, 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 whoa! You're just. I mean, <laughs> yeah, how much deeper into too. the? We're going deeper and deeper. Are you kidding me? So you were ensconced. I, I mean, what? To. Like how? Let me ask you. Just in fairness, I mean, where did your? I know you're. Like, where did your ears grow the most? Younger cats, their ears are... Lo- wait a minute. I think it was in the sixth month in utero. In, in, in utero. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Because, like, because cats today, their ears are locked. I mean, but in in the past, Bird, people like Charlie Parker, they'd, they'd, they'd listen to every radio station and play everything. Didn't matter if it was country, western. They'd run through it. They'd learn to play it in every key. And their ears were wide open. They could play all types of substitutions and blow over the top of stuff. Today, um, and the the major part of it is that they were ear, the your generation was ear trained. You might have been a little bit different, but today cats are learning to read music before they can hear it, and their ears are locked. That's one of the issues. And I just wanted to know where your where your ears grew the most, and were you an autodidact? I don't know whether I characterize well first of all uh, yeah i'll answer that question in a second i don't know whether i could clearly say that cats are locked into reading music i i know a lot of young players that are you know doing the same thing that i did which is just picking it up um the way it happened for me was i tried piano lessons didn't work i tried you know that was like from five to ten years old didn't take then i was impressed with trumpet um, heard Rafael Mendez or something in some high school gymnasium. And I said, I want to play that. And, uh, but I had a horrible aperture and lousy lung control. So after three years, I gave up on that. My dad had a ukulele sitting around. He showed me three chords. Um, and, uh, he may have known more chords than that. But in any case, uh, it was a, like a plastic ukulele. And, and I started playing it. And I said, Oh, chords. You can make a chord like this, right? And you can make another chord like that. And guess what? Those chords fit songs. I know songs. I can play songs using these chords. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, and I've gone through like years of, of of lessons, but nobody had taught me the basics of this is a chord, this is a melody, <laughs> this is an interval. <laughs> None of that stuff. I learned that all by ear, and this was. Um, and I started learning Buddy Holly tunes and country tunes and Roy Orbison tunes and Everly Brothers tunes. I was really proud when I learned how to, learned all the chords for Poor Jenny. <laughs> right. But yeah, I mean, basically, you know, I'm Beatles generation, so um, uh, what those guys were doing. Well, I mean, it, let's let's be clear. I mean, it, you know, like Ringo has incredible time, but he's not some wank. He's not some riffology wanker cat. I mean, he he will his groove feels so good. But it, we are so wrapped up in technique and facility today because the, the reason that things were so magical at that time is that there were no schools. I mean, there was there was Berkeley and North Texas. The the the, the language of jazz. I mean, blues set that aside. That's a street music. But I mean, the language of jazz was a street music. You can't codify that language. So. You have cats now learning to read before they can hear the music. You heard, you learned everything by ear. That's the point. Is yeah. that that's why you got your individual sound, and that's why today yeah. there's a, the crisis is we have a homogenization. And I'm talking about instrumental, improvisational music. I can't tell who anybody is. There's a homogenization of sound, and that has everything to do yeah. with the fact that people are, you know, they've codified a language that came out of. You can't codify blues. So in any event, you yeah. you're just a lucky you're a lucky cat. How did you wind up um, meeting Hall and Oates? I mean, was that just just sort of just serendipity? How did that happen? 
I was I was a staff writer at this production company in the Schubert Building in in Philadelphia. It was above the Schubert Theater, and Gamble and Huff were on the sixth floor, and this production company was on the second. Holy cow! And um, Tommy and I were working there, just the two of us. And he brought and we brought in the drummer from this original band that Tommy and Jim and I were in. His name was Jim Helmer, and we became the session guys, and 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 we recorded a bunch of records. Uh, or singles that this the owner of this production company would take to North uh, to New York and sell to various labels under different band names. The band didn't exist. It was session guys, the same guys, and I was writing most of the songs for it. <laughs> this is you know I'm so humbled to connect with you because I mean the first two cats. Well, you know there was clearly you had you know Rainy Purdy. Cornell in that range. Then you had uh, the Funk Brothers in Motown, and then you had uh, I'm not even doing. There was stuff going on at Brunswick and New Jersey, but now you're you're who was you were the Studio Cats? Who were the Studio Cats in in that bill? What were the names? You you said the drummer. I didn't recognize his name, but who? Well, there was Gabble and Huff was there, and and we were the Session Cats. So uh, you asked about Daryl. So Daryl came came in one day and I don't know how he found out about this production company or who brought what, what was in. the name of the company um, by the way what was the name of the company John John Madera Productions John Madera and, uh, Productions Double Diamond and Double Diamond Music and and John had me writing for BMI and ASCAP so that my BMI tunes were done under the drummer's name Jim Helmer <laughs> are you kidding me <laughs> yeah and then yeah cuz he he needed to have pre- show that he was a active publisher in both on both sides of the performance arts, you know, performance rights organization. So in any case, <laughs> so I was writing for BMI and ASCAP, um, <laughs> which you're not supposed to do, but, um, and, and, and who else? And so, but I mean, I mean, cause I, I'm familiar with, you know, like you said, uh, uh, Ronnie Young, Vince Montana, but that, those were different cats. That it was a different group. Yeah, well, that was Gamble and Huff's uh, section. So you had Vince Montana on Vibes. You had uh, Norman Baker. You had uh, Ronnie. I'm uh, sorry, Ronnie. Ronnie Baker. God, I'm Ronnie Baker and Norman Harris. And, Norman Harris, second. I think. Uh, Norman Harris, right? Is that right? Norman Harris yeah. and Earl Young, and then there were other guitar players there. There was uh, Bobby Eli, uh, and. Uh, but who was the other one? So cool. Uh, I'll look it up. It's going to yeah. come back to me in a minute. It's going to come back to me in a minute. <laughs> he was the dealer for the guys who smoked. <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember his name. Of course I can't remember his name. I was probably only around. Well, no, that's, you know, the, that's the name that, that, that escapes me, Joe Tarsia. Well, Joe started Sigma. We did the, um, our, our little group, Tommy and Jim and I, uh, went in and did the maiden voyage in Sigma. He got everything wired in. He put the floorboards back down over the wires. He said, come in, try out the studio. So we were there on a Thursday night before he even opened or did any sessions there. So we, we, we were the first ones to, to put notes through Sigma Sound. No, you were. Are you kidding me? Not kidding you. Oh Joe, Joe liked my songs. You know, he, he had been an engineer at Cameo Parkway. And that was sure, the first time I did sure. anything for this production company. So we did two singles. Um, I don't think they're on YouTube, but they might be on YouTube. Um, and Joe loved them. And we cut them eight track at Cameo Parkway. So he liked us and he wanted us to come over and, and try out the studio. So we wound up being the first people in the studio. <laughs> and was it, you, you know, because like they, they uh, when I interviewed... Uh... I've done a few interviews with Randy Brecker and, and, you know, Blue Note was basically, that was uh, for black jazz artists, but then they did an offshoot called Solid State, um, uh, which was for white artists. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. you know, if you really look at Blue Note, I mean, Bobby Hutcherson, Andrew Hill, uh, you know, the, the, the Grant Green, Joe Henderson, it was, it was, they were African-American. And then Solid State had... Randy Brecker, Thad Jones, Mel Lewis band, and et cetera, et cetera. And, and I wonder, you know, because when I think of Sigma Sound, 
um, you know, the intruders, uh, main ingredient, a lot of different, like, were you the, the cats writing for the white bands or did you write for the black cats too? Um, the former would be more accurate. Yeah, because it, it, is that, I mean, even though maybe it wasn't spoken, it wasn't like you were writing tunes for the main ingredient, but you were writing it for more. Well, no, Gamble and Huff were um, a very forward organization. They were Philadelphia's Motown. And Motown was an almost all black outfit, except I think there were a couple of white engineers there. Sure. Um, and. And Gamble and Huff wanted it to be the same thing. They wanted to be the Motown of, of uh, Philadelphia, and they more or less were. Um, they didn't have the same uh, acts like Marvin Gaye. They they concentrated. They looked for groups, you know, singing groups that were out of other cities. And then he'd bring them to Philadelphia. So um, they didn't get the Chai Lights, but you know, the OJs weren't from Philly. Right. So, they were Jer- um, They were Jersey, I think, or maybe I don't. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I don't know where they were from. I mean, the only Jersey rock I knew was Gary U.S. Bonds. That's the only thing I knew was from Jersey. <laughs> if anything else was from Jersey, you know, I they did. Were, I did. Oh, no, they I weren't did. opening up to it. So, I mean, you would say, though, that, um, I mean, the, the hackneyed question is, what are the ingredients of a great song? But I'd say to myself, some of that just comes out in the process I remember the late great Paul Jackson told me, rest in peace, the bass player from uh, the Headhunters, he just said that him and Herbie, when they were playing, when they were doing, creating what would be known in the lexicon as funk music, before you, as you know, that you'd say, let's play a funky blues or play something funky, but there was no word in the lexicon for funk. When they were like creating that, that language, uh, Paul told me a lot of information, a lot of music would just come out during the actual time like it just fell through it comes through you in like it's like writing i mean would you say that a lot of your writing he said, he said somebody named paul who was that uh, it was paul jackson was the bass player in the headhunters with herbie hancock oh right it, yeah yeah one of so, my favorites. yeah exactly so so I, I saw that band live at um um yeah i saw him in new york on 52nd street my friend friend Pitt took me to hear the headhunters band so yeah, yeah. I'm so so what I, what I wanted to ask you about is like how you over time recognized that you um, were not fully responsible for the material you were writing, but rather you were a conduit for information coming through you from the heavens when you got out of the way of your own ego. Well, that's I, the perfect situation. But you know, anybody who's a who's a professional songwriter gets up in the morning, yep. and and works you know, has their cup of coffee and their breakfast or whatever, and they go to work. That's the way um, somebody like um, somebody I'm, I'm hoping to write with soon, um, Gary Nicholson from uh, Nashville, wow. um, who's written lots and lots of hits. But he's a working songwriter, and he collaborates a lot. So um, he writes room songs, you know, so somebody comes over, they're in the room together, and they're working hour after hour after hour. And they have a sense of, of craft about it. So it's very hard to get the conduit. I've had that experience. Can you talk about the time um, when you, can you talk about a specific song where it just came through you, it yeah, just fell out of you? Sure. For sure. I'll tell you, uh, I was in the back room at John Madera Productions um, and I wrote the first song on my second album. It's called For the Minute. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we did not record it. Um, no, that, I'm sorry, I've got the place wrong. No, I was somewhere else. This was a couple of years later. Um, I was in a writing room, but it wasn't Madeira's. Um, and I was there by myself, and all of a sudden, this chord progression and these lyrics came to me. And the whole thing came to me in, I don't know, half an hour. It was done. And if you listen to that song, the, the, it's not a standard chord progression. There's modulations in it, very much like in Second Avenue, where it modulates into a, another key with each verse. Um, and after I finished it, I played through it once. I was in tears because I I literally did not know how it had passed through me. All I know is that it was extremely emotional song. Mm. That every note of the melody had, 
took you to a place that was consistent with the lyrics and the lyrics had really something to say. And I don't know how I did it. I read, you know, I read interviews with, um, say, Dylan, um, and he talks about riding the wave. And there is a lot of riding the wave. A lot of songs have started that way. Uh, when I wrote Rock and Roll Love Letter, totally different kind of song. Um, but I knew it was a hit. I just started playing it on the guitar. I was in this house with a slate floor that we were renting here in Woodstock. And I was there by myself, middle of the afternoon. I just started playing the riffs that are the opening riffs from Rock and Roll Love Letter. And all that stuff was coming out of my guitar. And then I, I read a verse, and then I wrote a chorus, and then I wrote another verse and another verse and the choruses and, and some variations on the chorus. And that whole thing was done in, I don't know, an hour. And I knew in my gut that I had a hit, and I was going, thank you, thank you, thank you. Then, you know, had Electra pushed it as a as my version, and it would have been a hit. I'm sorry, <laughs> so the, the original one that fell through you, it never got released, or it got totally turned around by the... No, it was, it was on my second album, and um, but uh, Electra didn't choose it as a signal. They didn't hop on it right away. Oh. And um, about, I don't know, four or five months later, six months later, you know, Clive Davis was scouting all, uh, my records at, when they came out, because he knew I was writing great songs. And... Um, and he heard Rock and Roll Love Letter, and he and he sent it to the Beirut City Rollers manager, and he said, you guys are going to record this song. No ifs, ands, or buts. <laughs> he ordered them to re- record it. And it was, a, um, I think, a top 20 hit for them in a lot of places, maybe a top five in certain markets around the world. That is so cool. I mean, how do you feel about I mean, the, the just the idea, it's so unique to, like, talk to someone like you where you write a song and – you know, it's just, it just, you know, it, it, you, it, it touches the heartstrings. Also, you can drop into the primordial gut, but then, you know, it's your piece and you pull it off and it doesn't really translate in your recording, but yet some other band does it and it turns into a massive hit. Like, did it take time for you to sort of remove your ego from the situation or were you just Happy be- be- no, no, no. Dylan talks about this. You yeah. know, if you have an idea, if you have a good idea, don't leave it around. Finish it off. Right. It's sort of like the Rock Island Line. If you want to ride, you got to ride it like you find it. Take your ticket to the station to the Rock Island Line. Well, that's that's the way to uh, to a song. You got to stick with it until it's done. You know, I have had songs that took me two months to write. Um, there was a song called "The Light of You" uh, on my third album. Really nice ballad. Clive was scouting my record for that. He wanted to do it with Barry Manilow, and I said, "I want the, I want the first license on this. I want a chance at making it a single." Um, but there's so few sell- syllables in that song. You know, it's a simple melody. It's got one syllable, another syllable, then a, a short line. Um, so it goes, "When my blue sky." Feels like it's falling through. Inside, I stay bright, filled with the light of you. So that's probably 20 syllables. And I had to find the words and the right sounding syllables for that. And that was sheer craft. It took me, I sat around for two months with me going back and back to it until it came right. I've got a song like Sitting Around Right Now that's like that. Great guitar part, you know, a melody as strong as Blackbird, but um, I cannot find the words for it. So hmm. it's everything, man. You know, it's not like it's going to come down from the heavens and just get delivered and you say, thank you, Lord, and that's the way it all happens. It's hard work. No, I was, and, meaning, I was meaning more like, you know, your, your track, the, the music that you made to that one song where you were crying and you knew it was gold – and the record company didn't pick up on it, and then some other band runs off, and it becomes a big hit. How did you? How did you? When you were younger, not 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 now with hindsight, but when you were younger, how did you feel? Aside from the fact that you you know it was nice, you you were the publisher, you you got paid, but just the idea that that band was was receiving accolades based on something that you knew that you channeled in your own voice. How did you? How did you deal with that at that time? Well. When you're a, song, a singer-songwriter, the first thing you realize is that 
you once your record is out, anybody can record it. It's sure. compulsory right. license. Right. So, uh, so you just have to resign yourself to that. If you if your version doesn't get out of the box in time, get out of the gate in time, there's other horses in that gate. And the same thing happened with um, Second Avenue. Um, we were climbing up the charts. We got into the 60s. And um, Roy Howey, I think his name was, uh, was a producer for Art Garfunkel, heard it, and had already recorded sometime in May or June of that year. And the record had come out in March, and we were just, like, clawing our way up the charts, you know, adding stations. Uh, small label, Paramount Dot. Sure. Uh, not a lot of cloud. And, uh, and then... Um, Artie's version was not not out yet. I ran into Artie. I'd never met him. I saw him standing on the corner of 56th and 6th. And I'm walking there with my girlfriend, and I look around my shoulder, and they said, I said, there's Art Garfunkel. <laughs> and I walked up to him, and like a chump, and I'm going to see Artie probably later this year for the first time in years and years. Um, Jimmy Webb's having a party, and... Uh, Wow. Or I think we're going to have a party or something. In any case, nice, um, nice. But but I walked up to Artie and I said, something's really stupid. I said something really stupid. I said, congratulations on your head, Artie. And he said, who are you? <laughs> I said, I'm Tim Moore. <laughs> You're coming out with Second Avenue, right? And I should have like gotten on my knees and said. Art Garfunkel, please. Well, I mean, don't yeah, but I, no, I'm, I, I just climbed yeah. up the charts. Don't steal my record. <laughs> and and so what happened? Um, just before that, I'm on my way to the Capricorn picnic in a plane, flying from Macon to to oh, no, from uh, Atlanta to Macon. And this particular fight's got no, nobody from but uh, nobody but uh, people from the record industry in it. Because it's the Capricorn picnic, and I can, why, why, why were you going now? How the heck did you wind up? I mean, that's another. The, the, my people, Tommy Tall. I mean, uh, Phil's uh, Capricorn Records was Phil distributed Walden. through Warner's. Yep, that's right. Yeah, Phil Walden mm -hmm. label was was distributed through Warner's, and I was on um, Asylum, Electra Asylum, and that's Warner's. So we were invited down to it, and we went. <laughs> so. We're on the plane. My manager comes back. I'm in a seat way in the back. <laughs> and he comes in and he sits down next to me. He said, well, Paramount Dot, just uh, Paramount Dot just closed their doors. I said, what? What does that mean? I said, they're out of business. They decided not to be in the record business. I'm going, well, what does that mean? <laughs> he said, we don't have a sales team out there getting records in stores. We don't have promotion team out there. And we're on the charts at somewhere like 60. <laughs> so this is July 31st of that year. So I got a record on the charts. Artie's, Artie's, view, Artie's record is pending. Um, I mean, it's all recorded and mixed and stuff. We don't know when they're going to release it. Within two days, uh, we get a call from um, David Geffen and from Clive Davis. <laughs> and and he's there asking my, my attorney slash manager um, what's happening with him. He's got a record on the charts. Do you want? I want to sign him. <laughs> and so, so, and so, this is all the threat of a compete. You know, along the theme of what we've been talking about, this theme of a second version coming out mm -hmm. and how I feel about it. Um, so, so the same day I had lunch with Clive Davis on the east side was car got a car out to the airport flew to california and i was in david Gevin's office by five thirty or six <laughs> o'clock in the afternoon i just want to be i and, want to ask you a question I, I, and david wine yeah. and dined me i mean i'm it was nice to have lunch with clive davis but david drove me out to Cher's house and we had butler served us dinner and <laughs> And Bette Midler came over, and I played a bunch of songs for Cher, and she said, I want to record that one. Well, you can guess what label I went with. <laughs> of course. I, no, I, you know, we're, Tim, we're going to have to do set two as soon as possible. I, I'm backed up against another interview right now, but I wanted to I wanted to ask you about, just for my own sake, like when when art art has to license that, you, you would get paid, though, no matter how good the song, oh, yeah. like he, he, how does it work when you're going to cover somebody's song? You have to ask for permission and then pay for the license. How does it work? 
You don't, you don't even have to pay, uh, ask for permission. All you have to do is let uh, the Performing Rights Society and Harry Fox, uh, the people who would pay the writer and publisher, um, know that you've recorded it. You don't have to call for permission. I, I'm, I'm thinking, but no, there, just to cover the tune, there's, and no matter how popular it might get, even if it's your, you get no money for that. Oh, I get money. Yeah, I get money for the every time it's played on the radio. So when Art no, I mean, you get money radio, every time that every anytime Art Garfunkel play that his version gets played, you get money for that. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Version, that you know, I mean, that's too. freaking. I mean, dude, you are like a reflective mirror of of sonic love, man. I mean, honestly, like how many how many people have you? I mean, I don't know, man. Like, I don't know. There's a lot of parallels between broadcasting being a rogue journalist and being a songwriter i think after this interview so i mean we have a lot more to get to so let's let's just let's break here and then uh and then we'll do set two really soon that'll be a lot of fun jake did you have a good time i mean yeah. we, we went on a little little trip here you really brought me all over the we were all over the country man that was my intention <laughs> yeah, i rehearsed yeah. i rehearsed for this like two days yeah, dude, you were on fire. I mean, dude, I mean, you you don't have to. Dude, you got, you got all the. I mean, it, all the you got all the the experiential stuff there. It's not like you're. I'm about to interview a younger cat right now who's, who was an actor going and now music. We'll see, we'll see his depth. But man, uh, yeah, great to connect with you, Tim. This I'll have this up later tonight. I had a lot of fun, Jake. Thanks for calling. It's great to talk to you. Yeah, you too. We'll man. Do it again. All right, man. Be cool. Bye for now. Later. Yeah. Great to connect with uh, legendary uh, writer, songwriter, uh, Tim Moore. And uh, we will be back with Tristan Lake LeBeau right after this. Oh, uh-huh. 